myself out. I am afraid of this. I'm terrified and paralyzed by. I am deathly afraid of. Welcome to the Sum of All Fears podcast with your host, me, Ryan Perio. Hello, and welcome to the Sum of All Fears podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Perio. This week, we go international again. This time, we're off to Hanoi, Vietnam, where I re- recorded an episode with Paul B. Kennedy, a chef and author. Uh, check out paulbkennedy.com for some amazing, authentic Vietnamese recipes and, and life in Vietnam. Paul is living in Hanoi, Vietnam right now, and it's was an amazing conversation. We had a great time talking about the difference in vacation and travel and all that is entails of living of a living in a foreign country as a as a you know as an American. It was a great episode. In this episode we talk about vacation versus travel, how he got started his traveling journey, why Hanoi, Vietnam? What's his life like at Hanoi, Vietnam? And if he has any traveling tips for any of us. Then we get into his fear of being trapped with no identification or money in a foreign country. So let's get into that interview right now with Paul B. Kennedy. All right. My guest this week is teacher, former chef, (laughs) and world traveler, Paul B. Kennedy. Paul, Hello. How yes. you do, how are you doing? What is life like in Hanoi at 9 p.m.? Quiet. It's very, very quiet. Not a lot going on. So it's not a very big party town at night. Yeah. It's more like the old the old place where it's just at once everything goes dark, it's every everybody's place goes dark as well. Well, they've got these pockets because they do it's not a big drinking country, but they do sell um, they call it fresh beer, the beer that they make daily and you have to drink it that day. So they do have pockets of like beer street or places where you, where some locals drink when they drink, they drink together and it doesn't take much, but they drink till they get drunk. Those places will have karaoke. So you might live in a quiet area that just happens to have karaoke. The karaoke goes on till midnight or so. And it's loud. It's not it's not just for the, the that business. They, it's loud enough for the whole block or two blocks to hear. So quiet in general, yeah, but it's quiet in general. So fresh beer, I'm intrigued. So it's so what what when you say it has to be drank that day? Why does it have to? What happens if it's not? Like, is it like not? Is it unfermented beer? Like, is it just? I don't know enough about the beer making process, but it goes bad, and. The good side, because we, you and I were talking about um, cost just before we went on, um, it's only 25 cents a glass. Wow. So <laughs> that's pretty good. That's, that's like a uh, uh, small town college, small college town beer pricing. That's dangerous pricing is what that is. For... <laughs> so, so, you, yeah. so you're originally from New York. And you were a chef in New York. How how did you end up in Hanoi? I left for a birthday trip in 2018 and just kept going. Just kept going. I made that choice to try it. And I just did not return from vacation. I mean, I, I have on, on trips home. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I just kept going. I said, why not? Why not just keep traveling? And uh, that's I started the life here. And so, did you was the first destination Hanoi? Was the birthday trip there, or did was Hanoi like <laughs> a, an extra stop after the birthday trip? The birthday trip was in Gre- was Greece. It was on a friend's boat in in Greece, and it started three days earlier in Italy because I thought I might see a friend before that. So I just said, okay, well, if I if I can see that friend, I'll I'll go to Italy three days before the trip. <clears throat> but after Greece, or after the birthday trip, I 
after I left my friends, after the 10 days, I just made that decision to keep going. And I stayed in Greece for another month where I met some more people to inspire me to keep, keep going, keep going, <laughs> run, run. Um, and they inspired me to go to Turkey. I spent a month there and I kept going. Uh, they, people thought I would live in Chiang Mai because a lot of expats do. Mm -hmm. But I got there. I don't know if you've been there, but it, it just wasn't what I was looking for. I didn't know what I was looking for because I didn't know I was even going to leave, <laughs> which, you know, if you don't know what you're looking for, but I, I knew within minutes of being in Chiang Mai, Thailand, that that was not for me. Okay. And I still didn't know what I was doing. But when I got to Vietnam, I, I realized the second in the same short, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes of being in Chiang Mai and not knowing or knowing that was not the place for me. The same amount of time in Vietnam, it clicked. I just knew, I knew I wanted to be here. Okay. So I made a life here. Okay. So what, what do you think made that? Was it just the, was it the community? Was there just like, just not, like you said, it's quiet. So is it something that you kind of seek out or just something that like, you know, I want, it's, I want something a little bit more laid back. Nothing, not as much, you know, action going on. It's not quiet in the daytime. This is a, Hanoi is a city the size of New York City. Wow. And it doesn't have high rises, but it has mid rises. No, it was the, the culture, the vibe, the overall. And I didn't get that in Thailand. Thailand's very uh, touristy, it's very Western influenced. So I think that was it. And as you know, the longer I've been here and the more I worked on, on writing, you start, there's a self-reflective process of, of why, why do I think that happened? But I, now I think it's, I was looking to learn. I was looking to experience a culture. I didn't know what that was. I, I simply called it the vibe yeah. when I landed in Hanoi, but now I realize it was what I wanted. It was such an experience, you know, an overload. Mm -hmm. It's a very loud, very loud city during the day, during the day, but nighttime is quiet. Yeah. So I, I, I call that what I guess traveling would be off the beaten path. Like it's not, you know, show me, show me non-touristy section. Show me, show me what real life is here. Not, not the, not the, not the glitz and glam. Show me like the daily grind for somebody that lives here versus the touristy hotspot and stuff like that. Like you kind of want to, you want to really delve into the cult, like you said, the culture, the society, and I think that's right. That's awesome. True. It's, well, you, you think about because living in New York, I hated, hated going to Times Square. Mm -hmm. Couldn't stand it. Could not. So I probably lived there maybe 15 years before I appreciated it. And I didn't appreciate it until it was, until it was when I was going through there and it was empty. So in the restaurant business, it was, you know, if I got off work, maybe two in the morning, there might be no one around. And I started to appreciate it because it was the people, the crowds I didn't like. And then with all that, that distraction gone, you start realizing, okay, now I, I feel what this is. <clears throat> so same with Hanoi. Uh, Hanoi, I tuned out all the traffic. Mm -hmm. this, this place is, it's all motorbikes. The whole population or 75% of them have motorbikes. So it's a lot of, and there's no, no um, rules for driving. So there's a lot of honking. It's in the and, and the motorbike bikes are loud. So I tuned it out because I'm from New York, so I don't I don't hear traffic. So again, when I got here, I was able to focus on what what, what else was around me, you know, like what the people were wearing, what people were eating. I didn't hear that noise because you, if you live in the city, you don't hear it. You yeah. tune out. The horns you just don't hear cars so same thing i was able to tune out all the busy parts of it and just uh, enjoy the the culture part so that t thailand didn't have so when you set roots here did you intentionally like because i know you were talking about being a chef <clears throat> did you yes. did, were you intending to be a chef here in hanoi and that just didn't happen? no okay so you when you left new york you left chefing behind as well I left everything. So, okay. So <laughs> the birthday trip, the, the theme was inspiration mm -hmm. uh, because I'd never, I'd never left the country. I'd never had a passport. 
Uh, I started planning a birthday trip. And once you start doing that and it's overseas, you start try, trying to figure out which friends to invite. And if you invite this person, will this person be offended? And will these people get along with this? You know, it's tough. And I, I scrapped all that. And I just said, you know, I'm just going to go with inspiration as a theme. It sounds cheesy as can be. I didn't know what the inspiration was for, but that was the, um, that was the theme. Um, I have no idea what I was talking about. That's okay. I, <laughs> okay I, mean, so my, I love traveling with a purpose, though. <laughs> That's such a cool idea, like to have a theme of the trip, not just to travel and see things, because everybody I know travels <laughs> is, what am I going to go do when I go over there? Like, I'm going to I'm gonna hit this tourist spot. I want to see this. I want to, If you're Italy, I want to see the Leaning Tower Pizza. I want to see Venice. Right, right, right. But you're doing it on a theme of inspiration. And I'm, yes, I'm yeah. fascinated by like, okay, what, what's considered inspiration when you go? Like, what are you, you know, do you look at tour spots? Do you? If, if I get sidetracked again, I'll lose my train of thought again. <laughs> um, okay. So the, the friends boat, these were people before I lived in New York, I lived in, in Charleston, South Carolina. And that's where I went to culinary school. I had a friend there who moved to New York also. Um, he got married, they had a kid, uh, they left their full-time jobs, sold their home in Brooklyn and bought, I love their, I love their story. They bought a 47 foot catamaran and decided to sail the world to teach their child, the world mm -hmm. through the child's eye, you know, in real life, they'd never sailed before. And they bought a 47 foot catamaran. They took a three day mm -hmm. sailing lesson. <clears throat> so that's whose boat I stayed on. I was thinking, I, I wasn't looking to emulate that yeah. by any means. I wasn't even looking to leave New York. Yeah. But I just thought, how cool is that? You know, what better people to, to spend my birthday with? I left them in Santorini. I stayed in my first hostel in my life. Again, I was thinking, why not? You know, experience something new. And that's where I, start, I met some digital nomads. And one of them, I was asking, could I do this? Could I do what he did? He said, you, you know, every job translates to something that where you can do it remotely. And he asked me what, what my field was. And I said, hospitality. He said, well, maybe not your field, but most fields. <laughs> I know. I was like, great. Well, there goes the inspiration. But <clears throat> so I was not looking to chef. I wasn't looking to leave. I wasn't looking. So I didn't really have that. I never thought about it. I didn't do any planning. When I got to Vietnam, by the time I got to Vietnam, so this is months later, somewhat along the way, I planted a seed of uh, the fact that a lot of expats open mm -hmm. hostels. So I ended up opening the hostel. That was my what I did. And then I opened a hotel, and then I opened a travel agency. I've, all, I've since, closed, since then closed all of them because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what I was doing. That's why I ended up doing that was my translation because my field one degree is hospitality and one's culinary. Yeah. So it's related. So what's what's what is how does what does opening a hostel entail? Because that's such a for people that don't know, hostel is kind of like a like just a almost like a hotel, but it's you know basically more like you're sharing your it's more like you're sharing it's like a camp it's almost like a camp camp cabin almost like you're you're all in this one location sharing kind of almost you know sharing rooms and stuff it's very it, not almost you do you share you share most most of the time you share have you stayed in one i have never stayed in one i've yeah i, I didn't understand the appeal Mm -hmm. That was kind of my, why not? I'm making this big step of not going back to New York. Why not stay in a hostel? Because I didn't, I didn't understand why anyone would want to share a room with strangers in some sort of dorm style living. Mm -hmm. I just didn't get it. <clears throat> so I stayed in one in uh, near the airport in Santorini and, 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 and nothing, it was very un uneventful. Nothing happened. Someone threw up in the trash can in the middle of the night, but nothing really um, exciting enough for me to, to understand it. Then I stayed at another one in Athens and that's where it was just smelly and people were arguing. And it was just disgusting. And I remember going, 
sitting on the edge of my bed going, why did I, why am I doing this? Is a hotel right across the street or next door that's exact same you know, cost. Why don't I just leave? But I decided to experience it. So what's it like to open that? So that's a hostel. Hostel is dorm style living uh, on a budget typically, mm-hmm. but people, there's two types. They're both on a budget. They're both typically less than a hotel. Although hotels in countries like Asia, they're, they're also pretty cheap. Um, there's the quiet ones and the social ones. The social ones, people go to meet other travelers or vacationers or ex, whatever it may be, people from different countries. Mm-hmm. And the quiet ones are strictly going, looking for a, a place to stay on a budget. So those are the two types of hostels. And that's what a hostel is. They vary in size, but typically you're sharing a room with three to 15 other people, usually in some sort of bunk bed. That's what a hostel is. But the same amenities as a hotel, you're just sharing a room mm-hmm. and often the bathroom, shower, et cetera. So that's what a hostel is. And what does it take to open it? Surprisingly, it's, it's extremely in it, um, inexpensive. Okay. But to open a business in general is very complicated. Yeah. Because they strongly encourage everything's in nothing's in English, which is not my problem. I mean, it's my problem, it's not theirs. I, I I'm the one who needs to learn Vietnamese, not them learn English. But they um <clears throat> they encourage you through um all the bills are everything's Vietnamese. You you need someone who's Vietnamese. So they pretty much back you into the corner where you have to have a business partner who's Vietnamese. So nothing's set up the same. You know, with the, 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 the electric bill, they'll come around and collect cash. You don't mail it in. There's, you know, the mail system is not, not the same. The, no one speaks English. Very few people. It looks, sounds so the like whole a, system. It sounds mafia style. Like they're coming, you're, like you, you basically open the register and hit, divvy out your cash. And... Well, it's... Uh, <laughs> we're in the we're in a different phase than than the U.S. is in growth and mm-hmm. government policies here. Um, it's different. It's uh, it's it's more complicated, but it's more it's less expensive yeah. to do it. It's it's more complicated, but also simplified because it's like these these are the officials. These are what you pay them, and you're you you move on. You don't have any kind of <laughs> I would say like long accounting or, you know, like, Oh, I've got this kind of tax break or anything like that. Like it's pretty much your even slate across the board, residential, commercial, whatever, whatever they take, whatever you need to pay. That's what you pay. And you move on. You snow, there's no figuring or, Hey, what about this? No, there, but everyone's got their hand in the cookie jar. Mm-hmm. So I've dealt with this more with the hotel because it was bigger, mm-hmm. but the, Police come by nonstop. Every policeman wants money, and there's different levels, just like there would be in a suburb. There might be the local sheriff and the city police and the county police and the state police, and they all want a piece of the pie. And they all have the authority. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of pay us or we'll close you down. Yeah. Or knocking on the doors and kicking people out of the hotel. A lot of the strong arm uh, give us money <laughs> that you would not encounter. So yes, it's less expensive to open it, but there's a lot more to deal with. <laughs> a lot more. Then they would they would they came by the hotel one time. So they all have different ways, different approaches. And one one set, one group of policemen came by and knocked on the doors. And they would, they wanted only the, the room numbers with foreigners. So I'm called a foreigner, not a, an expat, um, because I'm not from here. They, it's not a derogatory term like it may be used in the U.S. Yeah. If you call someone a foreigner. So I'm the foreigner. They would knock on the foreigners' hotel rooms um, to tell them that if anything happened, that the police would not come to help them. Okay. So some of them would literally close us down and to force us to kick everyone else out of the hotel. And others would go and, and strongly encourage the guests to leave 
through a threat such as we're not going to help you. If anything happens to you in this hotel, you're on your own. The police will not help you. <laughs> it's so bizarre. It was just every day. It was something else. Wow. But I liked it. <laughs> but I mean, again, if it's if it's you, I guess what you said, inexpensive. It's not. <clears throat> it's not as it's minor versus like this is you know my business. That's you know minor here and there. And with a hostel, I feel like you're recouping your money rather quickly as you because with the number of guests and stuff per room, you're just like, OK, well, I've already kind of almost recouped, you know, to, to keep going. Yeah, well, the, the, the difference was, yes, the, the police know that the hostel is less profitable, mm -hmm. so they don't bother with it. So they know the hotel is more profitable. They know the hotel's got more foreigners. That's where they go. That's so yeah, the it's easier to it's it's cheaper to open a business here. But once they know that a foreigner owns it, and once they know it's profitable, then then the fun starts. <laughs> then the fun starts. Be amazing if they could also chip in ideas, like just kind of also like you know, hey, you know what you should do, you know, like some. <laughs> <laughs> you can give you little, give you little ideas and stuff like that. Little, little team meeting. Be be yeah, almost anything. like a mini investor. Like it'll be a mini investor that gives you some ideas. But yeah, that's yeah. that's I, I I never thought of it because I part of my questions, yeah, absolutely, is like what's it like living in in a in a foreign country? Because there's there's some things that are kind of like where you came from, but the rest is kind of not exactly like it's. Well, but I, it, it all is very, very similar, though. Yeah. Every almost every situation, if not every situation, I draw a parallel to New York. So, with New York, with the restaurants, it's uh, we have health inspectors, and they have enough power. In most states, I've worked in, they have enough power to close you down. You know, they just don't. They just choose not to cho to to find you or cite you on every regulation. Mm -hmm. They have quotas like everyone else does. And they have people following behind them who check their work, essentially. But, you know, in New York, is since I came from there most recently, I remember more of their rules. You know, they would count the flies or count the bugs or count, you know. You can find one place with any bug, you'll find another bug. It's not, they don't travel on their own. They're yeah. part of families. So the they have enough power. So it's kind of, it's very similar. You know, you never know how much they're going to charge you. Either you never know if they're going to shut you down. They're going to show up periodically unannounced. Very similar. It's just theirs is legal. Mm -hmm. There's a set of rules that supports what they do here. They're, they're on their own. So there's, there is a, a parallel to that. So everything, I think every, almost everything has, has that mm -hmm. parallel to it. So do you, do you still want to open hotels and stuff like hostels? Like if you were to, once COVID, I guess opens, I get back up or is that, are you out of that completely? And you're on to teach. The, the entrepreneur part of me wants to, and I always get into it. I have to pull myself back because I, I could not have been happier when COVID hit. I was so happy because you have to constantly micromanage. The bills are in Vietnamese. The, mm -hmm. Communication, you have used, it's very difficult to manage a place, to run it. If you can't under, you can't speak to the vendor, you can't speak to whomever who is yeah. part of your business. <clears throat> very, very difficult. And the second that you have an employee who speaks English, the amount you pay them is going to be yeah. five, eight times more. Yeah, especially if they know you Vietnamese and English. Like once they. Yeah, that's the thing. They. Yeah, if they are they're Vietnamese, oh, they no, if they just speak English. Yeah, you, you, there's no way I could afford them. If they if they were American, I could not afford them and run a profitable business. If they're Vietnamese who speaks English, it's, it's also very difficult to yeah. make a profit. You know, part of the reason you're so profitable is because you're part. You know, part of the cost, the labor is very low. Yeah. So what do you teach now? So are, so you said you were a teacher. English. Oh. And IELTS, yeah, which is the uh, proficiency test. 
but you don't really teach. You just uh, speak louder and mm-hmm. slower. <laughs> yeah, my friend, I have a comic friend who actually he teaches Chinese uh, children English. And so he's basically just uh, it zoom zooms into them and teaches them English and right and chi- and they learn Chinese and stuff and it's he's a, he has to work with them so I it's a it's a real you know it's a booming business like we're becoming global slowly but steadily oh like yeah we're we're giving access to other people's you know to other languages to breaking down the language barrier for all kinds of things just business and everything it just eventually we'll have kids that probably speak four to five languages like maybe not my lifetime but that's the direction we're heading is almost uh like we're you know unifying in a way it's a global world yeah and it wasn't for us but i realize it's that even though this is a communist country it still has this capitalistic aspect to it so there's really no interest in teaching them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's really just profit driven. It's, you know, give them minimal improvement you know, and keep them happy, keep them entertained. It's more about, it's a business. It's really not about any sort of progress mm-hmm. in Vietnam. Anyway, I can't speak for where your friend teaches, but it's, there it's more it's very profit driven yeah but you have a valuable skill i mean you then you should you should basically maximize the value of that because that's what is is you know funding your your way of life <laughs> and so i i totally oh, definitely yeah i totally get definitely. that and so you you said there's a difference between vacationing and traveling so what what do you define as different between becomes you become vacation to traveler. Where is that, I guess, line in the sand? The It's the intent. So the wanting to experience it and maximizing that. So the intent to learn, I think, is probably the biggest. And then part of that qualification would be would be traveling by yourself because to maximize the learning mm-hmm. um, you can't have that distraction of having someone with you you know there, there's other, and there's red flags i think like i'm um, staying in a social hostel mm-hmm. would not be someone who travels because they're going there with the intent of meeting other people probably continuing on with experiences with them going on tours or motorbikes, but you're going there for the purpose. You're staying at that place. You have another option, a quieter hostel. You're choosing the one where you can speak English or a common a language that you know. You're choosing to interact with people from other places, not from the place where you are visiting. So it kind of goes counteracts to, to yeah. wanting to learn about the culture of where you are. That's again inspiration. You tra- you're, 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 the theme is inspiration, and so you're you're <laughs> you're inspired by the experiences of people that maybe are shared with you in the hostel, or that you that you see, or that you're that you're that you see with your own eyes sometimes when you go out to different places and stuff. Like, oh, this is how they, this is amazing, and you just pull that all in, and it's amazing that you can you've managed to keep going and to be able to, because I feel like a lot of people when they get to like a month <laughs> of, of staying in a country there, there's, there's in some people's minds, there's gotta be a little bit of panic of how do I, how do I, you know, how do, how do I get back home? How do I, how do I afford this? How can I take this much time off of work? How can I, you know, there's all these little doubts of how can I, stay here versus you know trying to find a job and like you you've been able to find work and you know the way to be able to maximize and learn and to utilize your skill set and everything else to kind of to keep going and it's 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 even in a field that people have told you well except your field you know like just you (laughs) i still love when he said i can picture him saying that to me (laughs) 
but, <laughs> but you still found a way to utilize that skill into a way that's that's allow given you a way of life pre COVID that allowed you to still go out and see the world and make a life in an, in an in a foreign country that I don't think anybody would ever fathom, you know, being able to do in, on just either chefing or, you know, things like that, just on a chef's salary or any kind of work, because it's such a, it gets terrifying. Like for you to, 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 even though to break through the language barrier in a way that, you know, is it that you're proficient in the language, but you've still managed to break through that barrier and say, no, I'm here. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to find a way to make this work. So in New York, um, the last restaurant group <clears throat> that I worked for, there was three restaurants and the handyman for all three, he, I believe he lived in the basement, but he was a deaf moot who we weren't sure, but we believe he couldn't write either or read. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But the, when we needed something fixed, a lot of times we were referring to, a, or I was referring to a, something at another establishment. So trying to tell me, for me to try to tell him what needed to be fixed from afar, um, not knowing sign language, <laughs> you find yourself improvising and learning how to communicate. I'm not saying this is how I, I manage in Vietnam, mm -hmm. but if 80% of communication is nonverbal or somewhere in that range, it's the same here. So I have the option of making an easier, easier, I guess, is the correct word, life and living in an expat area. Um, it would be all the businesses have signs in English and some of the employees speak English. And, and I choose not to. I live in a, a local area where there's no, like everyone, uh, I don't want to say knows me, but I stand out. And yeah. and yeah, I, I can't. A lot of things I just can't do by myself. But for the most part, if I need something, I can, or I, not for the most part, there are times where I can go out and get something by myself. <clears throat> but I, you end up just um, adapting and figuring out how to manage. So I needed a, a ream of paper for the printer. And sure, I went to a place that sold it and they tried selling me the penned undergarments, you know, I, even if I, sh I even showed them a picture of a ream of paper and they're just, even with the picture, they had a tough yeah. time getting it to me. They couldn't, I ended up having a friend. So you just adapt. Um, so anyone could, yeah. anyone could do it. I just figured out a way how, and I decided I want to keep maximizing mm -hmm. my experience here, which is why I do not live in, in an expat area. Yes. Nor do I associate with expats. Nothing against them. Yeah, I just if I have my druthers. It's it's. I'd rather not. I'd <laughs> rather have Vietnamese friends who who speak some English. But that's just a testament to your determination, though, that you're able to. I'll I'll find a way. Like you're just basically. Yeah, I'll find a way. Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, that's it's such a it's such a keen survival because so many people would be like, you know, this. I I they would just struggle with that, or they would just pack it in and say you know I'm I can't I can't get what I want I'm frustrated but you you're like yeah it's frustrating but if I could just keep at it just a little bit more well I'm zen I'm very zen but I also have very little patience so how I remain zen is I eliminate these obstacles as much as possible while still getting what I want so if I, now I know if I need more paper, I just immediately ask, you know, the, the friend who gets, goes and runs my errands essentially. Um, so I, I make it a purpose of trying to remain Zen because I don't want to get stressed out. Yeah. But to do that, I have to, if I see an obstacle and I can't fix it, I just keep going. I'm drinking, um, there's, my allergies are somewhat affected sometimes in Vietnam. So living here in this neighborhood um i was turned on to herbs mm -hmm. herbal medicines that i wouldn't have gotten if i lived in the expat yeah. expat area i would be taking their version of an allergy medicine which is called tiffy but instead i'm i'm using some sort of random herbs which work amazing 
for my allergies. Better than anything I've ever had in the US. My allergies stop almost instantly with it. And I love that. It's every aspect is like that. Everything is an experience because of the fact that I've made these choices. How has the herbs worked though? Have they er- have have they been effect- have they been very effective or is it, you know, like amazing. Awesome. Amazing. Instantly instantly and i grew up with a lot of allergies a lot like shots um two shots twice a week so four shots a week constantly taking medicine um but this i just take and so i've I've gone through how you know having had allergies my whole life Mm -hmm. i've run the gambit i know you know if i go in someone's house who has a cat it would be, you know, I won't make it out alive. I mean, not literally, but it, yeah. it feels that way. Even if I don't know they have a cat, my allergies will know. Um, but so I've, I've experienced allergies and all the problems my whole life. This is the best stuff I've ever had. And it's, they're instantly gone. It doesn't taste the best, but it's not bad. That's awesome. What is the cuisine like over there? Oh, it's delicious. Yeah. Cause I was like, it's, 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 it's a lot of, I would say, like, I would call pet fair or I would say, but just like, like street food. Like, it seems to me like it would just be a world of street food, but maybe that's just because I have like bon mis here and like, I get the highlights bon mis and uh, what's it called? Uh, but we have a lot of, yeah, but, but the pho and the bon me are there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everything's Westernized. It's not really what we have here. Okay. So here bon mi just means bread. So a banh mi would mean a loaf of bread or, or it could mean a sandwich mm-hmm. and it can have anything on it. So living in New York, I always thought I knew where and what to get at the best banh mi place, but that I never, never see those banh mi's here. Okay. Ever. Not <laughs> once. So no banh mi's whatsoever. Oh, well, banh mi's are big, but oh. it just means bread or sandwich. So okay. in the morning it's going to be uh, a banh mi with a fried egg with or without pate also. Something like that. So lunchtime might be meatballs. Mm-hmm. Um, or just might, if someone says, you want to get some banh mi, it might just be a, a loaf of bread. If you want to have some bread. But it's not that uh, pickled daikon. It's not that. Okay. It's not that. Okay. So it just means bread. It's, just, it, it's If you take away banh mi and just replace it with the word sandwich, that's yeah. what it means, so, essentially. But so, it, can mean, it can mean bread also. Just yeah. nothing on it. That's still kind of, it's almost intriguing because you don't know what kind of, of sandwich you're going to get. It sounds like you just. Well, no, you would say, just like if you said sandwich, you okay. would not go order a sandwich. You'd say, I can have a turkey sandwich okay. and I have a blank sandwich. So fill in the blank and every place will sell something different, whatever they're good at, because the menus aren't extensive because most of the businesses, including restaurants, are run out of people's homes on the yeah. first floor. So it's, it's not going to be. Some of the little chain places might have a choice of 12. Yeah. But most of them, that place or that person on the corner, that lady might only sell uh, one or two kinds. You got two. Make a choice. <laughs> Choose wisely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, I wonder if you chose this city because of your fear. Like, if, if, because New York and everything with, with your fear. Go ahead and, I guess, tell the listeners what you're afraid of. You know, you and I were talking about uh, fear of losing passports, but I guess maybe because I never had one until I left mm-hmm. New York, Yeah, maybe two days before I got it. So I never really had any experience yeah. with what if I lose it? Because I didn't even know what it meant. I didn't know what a visa was. I didn't understand it, its importance. And then in Vietnam, you need it for pretty much everything. If you want to take a train or wherever, you, you know, say in a hotel, you simply need a passport. But I've learned that if I have it on my phone, it's not an issue. Yeah. They can use that. So I've never had to deal with a loss of, I've seen people who have lost their passport who then couldn't return to their home for, you know, a couple of weeks. But there's also that greasy palm issue where they could, but they just chose not to pay the individuals in the office. But my fear and this fear does come from the experience is um is not having the money here yeah is losing is losing my cards or losing money because you really are you're screwed you're you're trapped and in greece i tried getting dealing with the mail system i remember them saying 
we have two day express. It just doesn't work. You know, we tried it. We have the envelopes, but we just don't do it. It's not. And I, I started understanding how the mail system in the U.S. is not the same as it is everywhere else. Oh, so I just received my replacement credit card. That I've been, one of the cards I've been trying to get mm-hmm. for two years. I just got it this week. Two wow. years. So yeah. there's a lot of restrictions. The So for my bank, they would mail me a replacement credit card. They would not mail me a replacement uh, debit card, but they would mail me a, an ATM card because it's a high-risk country. Yeah. And the mail systems are, anti- are very antiquated. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, even if it makes it into the country, you have no way to contact them to guide that that mail from the hub to you. You have just, it's not, we don't have the same mail system. Oh. It's just not set up. So a huge fear because it's gut-wrenching because it's, it's it's very and I and I, I dealt with this when I lived I, in the south, Ho Chi Minh. And I, I think I may have lost one of my cards then. I had no access to cash. And I, I ended up Western Union myself money. And because I knew it was such an issue and you have a limit to, to do it, and they could instantly, it's a communist country, they could easily change the rules right then and there. So I was maximizing the amount of money I could take out every day. So every day I would take out 300 bucks, 300 bucks, just to squirrel away the money because I was so afraid of running out of money. Yeah. I just didn't know what else to do because you, you can't, there's not a, a, a bank here where yeah. you can just have someone wire you money. You just don't have options because they control the money. Yeah. So you can't send money out of the country. You just can't do it. That. It's a, you know, that's just not the, how the country works. And I would never have thought of that. Yeah. I would have never known that. I just thought, oh, you're in the U.S. You can send money wherever you want. Yeah. And you can. But you can't send money out of countries like this. And you can't, it's difficult to get money in. Like it's very, someone can send you money, but you may not be able to access it. And it's just very, 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 very complicated. Yeah. And it can affect you when you're trying to leave the country. They can find you for it. Find you? Very. Yeah, you can have penalties imposed on you for X, Y, Z because they have the records of this money. They want to know where it came from. And you know, if you spend money here, sometimes they can they can ask for verification. Like when I owned a business, I was not allowed. The only money that you could deposit, every, every cent had to be accounted for with receipts. Mm-hmm. And the only way I could take money out would be if I had a, a local person at the bank with me. It would take you know an hour and a half if I wanted you know a couple hundred bucks out of the business. Just very difficult. Wow. Very difficult. That would so the fear of not having money here is overwhelming. Is very <laughs> overwhelming. Because and with work now, you know, they if you set up your account through your work, now a lot of foreigners or expats, not all of them deal with this, but I look for, I look for more long-term. So a lot of them will have their, whoever their employer helps set up their account. Then I don't know if they realize their employer then has access Mm -hmm. because they have a contract. So they usually have penalties in their contract. So if, if someone quits their job, these people can now show the contract to the bank and, you know, keep, a couple thousand of their dollars out of their account. It's very, very complicated. And every bank is different because again, there's no countrywide regulations, very confusing. So with the money, like with my current employer, they do not deal with that. They don't deal with my bank. That's because I've had money here and I don't want to say too much, but you can get it out. It's just very, and back, you can do some of these things. It's very complicated. If you get caught, you're in trouble. Wow. That would be, yeah, that would be terrifying. Like, I had a, it's very, my friend, I had a friend who was a comic and he was, he was traveling overseas and he was doing something in Tokyo, Japan. And he apparently dropped his passport in the taxi. And then the taxi like drove off and he went to the air. He was trying to leave and realize he left the passport in a taxi cab in Tokyo, Japan. <sighs> and he's like, He's like, I pray. He's like, dear God, if you find my passport, I will, I will quit drinking. I will stop partying. I will, 
I will I will do anything. And he said, the phone came in. He's like, passport, found your passport. He's like, 10 second rule. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, a friend of mine, before I left the country, before I left the U.S., he had advised me, he said, don't pack, don't bring a suitcase, just bring a backpack. He wasn't thinking long-term travel. He was just guiding me for traveling in general. Mm-hmm. He said, because if you lose your luggage, it's very difficult. It's just not worth it. You'll be back home by the time they find it. It's just a pain. So just pack everything for the carry-on. And that's been very helpful to me because mm-hmm. I've seen people who have lost their luggage, like you said, left it in the cab with the passport. And there they are with no passport and no luggage. So I've lucked out with some of my choices. I have my passport picture on my phone, only traveling with a backpack. So I've never had to deal with that. But the money thing, I can't, I can't get around. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so surprised. It really, I got it this week. I got it two days ago after a two year battle of trying to get it. And the other ones, I just didn't even bother. But the one credit card that's linked to the same bank, I, I really wanted because I, you can't get a backup um, debit card. Yeah. So that was my, the best side, um, plan B for a credit card because it was linked to the same bank. Again, because if you have no money, you're really screwed. Yeah. Like <laughs> if you could, have no money. Like I couldn't imagine being robbed or something like that to where you just lose all your cards or anything like that. Like, ooh, you know, just, just the thought of you know, just, you know, having everything taken from you and being in a foreign country where you can't really explain or, you know, kind of get any closure probably on that on that event and just have to frantically work to cancel those cards and make sure if that- travel was open you know yeah. i could fly back to new york mm-hmm. but with travel closed there's i'm i'm limited yeah my options are really limited so yeah the fear of, of not having money while traveling again i never traveled mm-hmm all I remember are commercials with American Express saying, you know, no yeah. worries. <laughs> They'll find you some, I don't know, Traveler, money orders or traveler's, traveler's checks. checks. It seemed so simple. Yeah. It wasn't that simple. It was not, it it's was, not that simple. It was anything Especially, but. it's anything but. Don't lie. <laughs> don't lie to me. Um, it's, yeah, it's not that simple. Yeah. And yeah, it's just it's very difficult. So do you have a straight flight from Hanoi to New York or do you stop like layovers in like Los Angeles or something like that? To... You have to layover, but it's usually in Taipei or, or there's another popular one I go through. Um, I think maybe Taipei is the most popular, <clears throat> but they just started or they're supposed to just start direct flights to San Francisco and LA. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't help me at all. Yeah. Really, time wise, I think it's the same. It might even be worse. Um, because then you have to switch and, and go on from LA to New York. <clears throat> but it's about 24 hours. Okay. But I don't mind it. It's, it's super, it's super nice. It's you they feed you well. You just sleep and eat for 24 hours. <laughs> I would rather, and I was before COVID, I was flying home more. So I grew up outside of DC. Mm-hmm. I was flying home more from here to home than I was when I lived in New York Hmm. because it's very, it's not complicated. The only thing I don't like is being in the airport to fly back because the airports in the U S are just horrible, long lines and very complicated and big airports. But here, here you show up, the flights on time. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. It's like going from New York to DC. The easy part was taking Amtrak because you just book your ticket, walk on the plane. I mean, walk on the train. Yeah. But going to an airport is very complicated with the, you know, getting the cab and the traffic. And then once you get to the airport, it's like a 45 minute hike to, to your gate. Um, but yeah, flying from Vietnam is easy. Sleep and eat for 24 hours. I could, I could do that. So what are some travel tips? So tra- one travel tip is don't carry luggage, just to, just backpack it. What are some other travel tips? Like, yeah, I never really thought about that until recently, but yes, the backpack is amazing. 
amazing. It's a, and I, I still, when I fly home, it's a backpack. I do not, I just travel with a backpack. It's the smartest thing you could ever do. Okay. Um, the having your, your passport in your phone, mm-hmm. all your information is very important. And I still, even though I lost one of my cards, I've been using the card from the image, from a, I just happened to have something. No, I wasn't preparing. I just happened to have it on my, in an email. Mm-hmm. I used that for my two years. Um, so I would say having the picture of your passport is super important. Mm-hmm. Super important. Um, and the backpack. And the third, I'd say probably a modium. <laughs> <laughs> I would say because, because you want to, ex- even if you come here to vacation, versus travel you're going to want to try the food yeah even if it's not vietnam you're going to want to try even if you're a picky eater you're going to want to try the food Mm -hmm. local to that area yeah and we don't have the same regulations as in the u.s yeah i'm not sure if people remember that or know that but there's no guidelines there's no here they don't even use soap or hot water um so use reality the you're there's a there is a chance that you might have an issue and if you are here mm-hmm. not home it's wise to be prepared yeah so emodium because if not you could really have a difficult time yeah especially if you're away from the hotel if you're two hours you know hiking somewhere on a tour bus yeah i could <laughs> really, that would not be that would not be good. I worked at this this restaurant in Charleston years ago, and we had we didn't use soap or hot water. Um, we just rinsed off the silverware. Yeah. A lot of times we would take the silverware off someone else's table and just wipe it and give it to someone else. It was kind of it's still open today, by the way. Um, but they had a lot of, of food poisoning lawsuits. Yeah. But I used to talk about that all the time. That was my go-to. I just love talking about how dirty it was and wiping, taking a coffee spoon off one table and giving it to another. But here, now I realize, look, the whole country, yeah. no soap or hot water. It works. It works. How I long- mean, here they use lime juice and there they didn't, but the lime juice is a trick. So how, how, how long did it take your body to adjust to like the local fare? Did that... How long is that pro- so if someone wanted to 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 basically not set up roots but maybe extended stay like a month or something like that like how long does it take your body to get used to the cuz like you said the water the water there may probably doesn't have the same filtration system as the US it could be better or worse <laughs> so bottle- yes bottled water bottled water and uh, it never it never took me any time okay i i did bring a supply of emodium and I used to take it all the time. Just, I was constantly precautionary, constantly. I don't care where I was going, what I was doing. I just took it, popped it like, like it was, I don't know, whatever, an opioid, opioid, opioid. Um, I constantly popped them, but I just stopped. And it's never, it's not a problem. But the reality is, is there's no reason it shouldn't <laughs> happen to you. Yeah. But I did happen to see a study in Lyme, Juice does work in killing bacteria. I was surprised. So they do use, they squeeze a little kumquat into the, like a big bucket of water and they'll just use that bucket uh-huh. and just, you know, same water, same lime juice. Interesting. But there, it does, it does seem to work at mm-hmm. the whole country. I thought it was something you had to build up your immune, immune system to, or mm-hmm. no. That would be it's my fine. thought too. Is like you know maybe yeah. you know like oh there's gonna be a rough patch here the first couple of weeks but if <laughs> I just if I just eventually my body is gonna be like you know okay well you start wondering what you know what's what did we learn because I am with all of my experience and edu- education in in the food area my I'm always like I'm aware it's your food should be between. 40 degrees and 140 degrees and no more than four hours. Like it's just ingrained in you. Yeah. Now you start wondering what's why? Cause it did. here they, you know, they don't, they don't own ovens. So they dry all their food in the sun. Mm-hmm. Um, they, <clears throat> they, re, they use refrigeration, but they'll get, you know, 
an animal will be killed and they'll put its meat on a table and then sit there all day long out in the sun. I mean, shade maybe, but it's still a hot country, but it sits out there all day um, with no issues, no issues. But if I saw someone do that in the U.S., I would never buy that. Yeah. You wouldn't. I don't think you would buy. I'm, I'm questioning on the whether. Side, yeah. <laughs> someone on the side, because everyone's outside on, they have folding tables. Yeah. Everywhere. And just fresh cuts of, of meat, poultry, whatever it is, fish. And it just sits there all day long so that's what, on ice, so but that's, no problem. So that's why everybody, no I guess that's how you got uh, all the early morning shoppers and stuff like that. Like everybody hits the market way early and then, cause they just. Everyone, yep. Yeah, everyone goes there early, but they can't sell that meat the next day. Cause no one wants it. Everyone wants fresh. That's so great. they'll usually sell it if someone wants it discounted. Yeah. And they put it in their freezer. That's crazy. Like I just never thought of like you, you like how how you have to portion that out so that you have fresh every day. Well, you go every day. Yeah. But I mean just like people wanting fresh, like to be the seller in that market. So you say you have fish, you have to have fresh fish every day. How do you how do you portion out enough to you sell for that day, but you don't have a lot of excess for discount tomorrow? Well, don't forget these are mostly family businesses yeah. that run out of the first floor of their house. They've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. So they rely on um, and these are all communities. These are all homes that are in neighborhoods that have been around for hundreds of years. So they're not getting new people there. Yeah. They're getting the same people. Same gener, you know, just maybe a different generation, the same family. Yeah. So are they having? You know, live no one's. Are they what? I was gonna say they have live fish in their house just to just to basically butcher the next day to to be fresh is what I'm wondering. Like, did they have like people with like the fish sellers have an aquarium of fish that are still kept alive so that they probably. can they can butcher them fresh the next day? The fish probably because they do keep them alive. Yeah. So I'm, I would not be surprised because I do go into people's homes and they have an odd number of huge fish in this fish, these fish tanks. It's not something that's pretty to look at. It's got to be for, you know, kept Yeah, like someone's going to sell it. But yeah, ever all the food is out and it's all day long and it's a hot country. Yeah. So get it while it's cold. <laughs> not even cold. It's yeah. warm. Yeah, I can't imagine buying warm three in the piece afternoon of warm fish. piece of pork that's been sitting outside for twelve hours. But we don't have a lot of flies here. Maybe that's part of the solution. Yeah. That I don't know. That is amazing. Like I could, and it just again because of it's a foreign country I, it, that would terrify me not having money because everything is so like turnover is this quick like. They, the person you're talking to today could not be there tomorrow. Like it is, they live, they live almost daily. Like it's basically like you said, everything, everything's fresh for that day. Your business, it's everything's, everything's so everything's, even though they're living there, that seems like it's so transient. Like it's so like from the next day to the, <clears throat> from the day to the next, it's so different, even though it's a big city and there are some trends, but it seems like, well, you know, today you could be this tomorrow. Nope. Not so much. And well, it's not like that though, because, because they've been running the same business out of their home. Yeah. The same thing. It's tried and true in the expat areas. Yes. But you can't, uh, very rarely do you cheat another Vietnamese mm -hmm. because you control it more so than going to the police. So the neighborhood would have an issue if you cheated someone else that lived in your neighborhood. So even though I'm a, a foreigner, mm -hmm. um, it probably wouldn't happen here in the expat area. It's different. Yeah. You run things different. They're different businesses, different style. The businesses that open there are geared specifically to the tourists, to the foreigners. I mean, mm -hmm. but here where I live, I wouldn't, I don't think I would ever encounter that because 
like they eat dog meat here still. So if you are caught stealing someone's dog to, because that's just a thing here, that's how they make money is they steal people's dogs. But that, if the neighborhood catches you, mm-hmm. they will beat you. So you don't even have to worry about the police. The neighbors will will all join in and they'll all beat you. So, it's so you don't you don't you don't cheat people in business in local areas. Wow. So it's almost like almost feels like it's like the army where they have those scenes where you're like if the troop if you're the guy bringing the troop down, the troop then handles it after after lights go out. Like they ha- in, it's all handled in house. That you will yeah. That these are if you violate the rules, they're going to make sure you're aware of the rules. Because the police don't. Uh, I mean, again, everything's set up yep. differently. But they, you know, they don't carry guns. There's no guns in the country, mm-hmm. so we don't have the same crime. We won't have the same issues. So some of these issues, um, when they're dealt with by the neighbors or neighborhood, there's they're not going to shoot the person. They're not going to stab them. You, you can't have knives. Or not that kind of knife. You can't have the. You can't have a weapon. So they may beat them, but they know it's going to be more about punishing them mm-hmm. and then um, shame. Yeah, you know, you brought your family shame is going to be a big issue with that. Yeah, that's versus versus a crime of in the U.S. Yeah, <laughs> but that's a little different. But it's such an interesting, you know, punishment then because it's a it's a burden that you brought on other people that by doing that, it's almost like it 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 solves itself because you don't want to be that group because you'll be ostracized and oh yeah and as you're saying like the it, being a part of that neighborhood is so I guess life is the lifeblood like it's so much it's a critical it's a critical need that you need yes. each other because other without each other, you're, you're sunk because they well, have- yeah, the hesitancy is you don't want to shame your family. And because they don't have the same pressure, like in the U S in the U S you might steal because you're greedy or desperate mm-hmm. here again, because there's multiple, multiple generations in one house because they lived in the same house. They don't have bills. So they don't need the money. Greed's not a part of life. There's no keeping up with the Joneses. Mm-hmm. So even that is less. So the, the the shame part would much, it would very much trump the reason that you would actually steal because you typically don't have a reason to steal. If it's not greed, it's not desperation, then are you bored? Yeah. So if you're just bored or you want something, but it's not greedy, you know, then shame's easily going to deter someone because wow. you have no purpose to steal. In the U.S., you, I don't want to say it's a purpose, but they, they have another reason. They want that yeah. money for something. There's a justification that. that that goes in here that is, yeah. and that's such a fascinating, because I've never thought of it that way. Like you, people, you know, think about family shame and they're like, you know, they don't get it, you know, like you, and that's such a great explanation is that when you take, when you strip down the reasons that it happens here, right. Then you, then it just becomes like something it's, it's just really just something almost malicious to that person or that you just, they, you just, they can't gamble. Yeah. They're not allowed to gamble. They don't have drinking problems for the most part. Drugs are illegal. Real, I mean, really harsh um, sentences. So I, I guess we should include all of the reasons, and that would, of course, maybe there are subcategories of why you would want that money or desperation, but all of those are taken away. So you, <laughs> there's nothing, and you, and every family pretty much has not everyone because it's a still a poor country. But if, when you have no bills, they have the extra money. If something, if they have a family emergency. So it's not like they would steal it because the family needed money because every penny they make, there's no, I mean, there's no expenses. They drive motorbikes. They, they live very humble lives. So they don't have a lot of, of personal belongings, but yeah, adding the, the, you don't have 
drinking problems, alcohol or drug problems. There's no gambling. There's no adding that to the list of why their justification. It wouldn't happen. Wow. It doesn't happen. So well, shame rules it. Shame trumps it. That is. Although if, if I lose my money, I might be out there. <laughs> I might have to. Yeah. But man, I, I, that's that would be the ultimate like just because you're just it's almost like a castaway like you're just a cat you'd be a castaway if you lost all your money like you just de- it no matter how many like things are around you it's a desert island because you're just prohibited from everything yeah what would but luckily it's so it's so cheap to live here mm-hmm. you know as long as you have a, a little egg with you yeah a little nest egg it's you're okay and it's part of that zen remove the the problems now i learn <clears throat> just keep some cash yeah hopefully no one hopefully my neighbor's not listening to this yeah um as long as i keep a, a little nest egg here and very little because yeah. i can live off of 550 bucks a month wow and that includes traveling once a month that includes all expenses and restaurants and everything so I can have a really small nest egg, small is relatively speaking, but um, and live and not have in and give myself a year to figure out how I'm going to start getting money again. Yeah. If I have however many thousand on me, then I can get rid of that, alleviate that fear mm-hmm. because it will give me a year to figure out the solution. Is there begging in that country? Like, is there a lot of? No, very little. Very, very. I'll see one every few weeks at a stoplight. Always handicapped. Wow. Like always handicapped. I don't see homeless because you're responsible for your family member. Yeah. So if your family member is begging or sleeping somewhere, they'll take them back to the family and say, "This is your problem. Wow. You take care of this. You, you know." This is you. You can't disown. This is not a. This is not a public problem. Wow. But most of the it makes you wonder what's happening in the U.S. because I've always assumed it's been drugs or mental issues. For someone not to have a, a someone's couch they can stay they can sleep on, you've got a problem. Yeah. You have a problem if everyone that you know and everyone in your family and friends they've all turned their backs on you then you have some problems. So it makes me wonder where the people are that have these problems Yeah, in, in Vietnam. Because, yeah, you're responsible. It's, it's your family member. They will, police will take them to your house. Say, this is, here is your problem. Here is your problem. Keep them. Well, Keep that's, them. that is, I would say that's, that's a stark and, you know, just, I would, I couldn't imagine like, you know, just again, bringing shame on your family there, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, that's basically, you know, right there. I appreciate you doing this, Paul. This has been an awesome conversation. <laughs> Likewise. Where can people find you on social media? If- they can uh, connect with me on Twitter, mm-hmm. Paul in Vietnam okay, or my website, paulbkennedy.com. But yeah, if someone wants to travel or has any questions, um, seriously, I, I, I encourage, feel free to reach out to me. Have you, have you thought about doing like a podcast or like a travel blog of sorts to, to kind of chronicle <laughs> yeah. like just, just like the living and, you know, just kind of different things, just little niche things of travel that I feel like you, you've got so much knowledge and stuff like this to, to, if you wanted to travel overseas to Asia, here's what to expect. Here's. Here are the suggestions. Um, no, I know I, I thought about it for like a brief second, mm-hmm. but it, I, I applaud you. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I'm happy not doing it, and I, I don't think I have the time or patience. I think it would add to the stress and take me out of my my zen zen world. Okay, I'm happy without the businesses. I'm happy without the podcasts. Okay. I'm happy if someone just reaches out if they have a specific question. Okay. 
to to um I'd be more than happy because I, I would love to encourage people to travel and without fear. I will yeah. give them advice to steer them away from the fear from traveling. Yeah. That I can do. Because there is there is that fear. That is there's that fear of I'm gonna be taken. the unknown. Yeah. Just the, the I I am vulnerable because these guys have unjustified been... unknown fear. Yeah. Unjustified. Well, <laughs> I will let you get to bed because it is 12 hours <laughs> forward and there's yes. so 10 p.m. Saturday night. Yes, it is. Thanks again, Paul. Ryan, good talking to you. Keep in touch. So that was Paul. That is absolutely terrifying to think about. To be absolutely just on your own with no money no identification and somehow trying to get either back home or to a a safe place basically where you can you can function because imagine with no identification how are you going to earn money for a job and everything else that comes with it how do you get money like he was saying with the mail like it's just it's a tenuous journey for anything that's mailed to get in And I just can't imagine what that would be like over and over again to have just live in that kind of terrifying reality that you're stuck and there's nothing you can do that you'd have to wait for a passport and maybe, you know, jail or wherever else you can potentially be, you know, just... It just it boggles the mind because you don't think about that stuff while traveling. Like you, you think about the excitement and the fun, but what if things just don't go your way? So check out Paul B. Kennedy. is on Twitter at Paul in Vietnam, Instagram at Paul underscore B underscore Kennedy, and check out paulbkennedy.com. Again, there's some fantastic recipes all kinds of, you know, just information about life in Vietnam as an American and how he's managed to to carve out a space for himself as well as, you know, just have, you know, a fun time and to live life and to live it his way. It's an amazing story. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, This week I did a private show in Carrollton with Alberta the Exception and Fonzo Crow as well as Casey. We had a great time. Uh, we had a great show. It was a great turnout. Wonderful crowd. Very supportive. Uh, this next week, I will be at Hyenas in Fort Worth on Thursday. And then, and then I'll have a week until I am out and about again. I think after that next week, the week after, I'm free. But then the 13th, I'll be at Dallas Comedy Club on one of their bangers shows for that night. And then the week after that, I will be at Hyenas Dallas all weekend with Rob Little. And then the weekend after that, I will be at Hyenas Fort Worth with April Macy. So more to come. I got more interviews lined up. I got some friends I've hit up for stuff. I'm going to get back on the podcast group and maybe see if I can get some more guests. I have one in the can and maybe hopefully the person that's pitching that guest to me would also like to be a guest because I can, I'd just love to talk to everybody. Again, thank you guys so much for listening. If you like what you hear, leave a review. And if you have suggestions for the show, email me at somefearfans at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening to the Sum of All Fears podcast, and I hope you guys have a great week. Also, I hope you had a happy Easter. And now some thank yous for the folks that make this show possible. Thanks to Barry Whitewater for my art and graphics. You can follow him on Instagram at bwhitehto. Get it? H2O, like water. You can also follow him on Facebook Music. A huge thank you to Gunnar Olson for the wonderful music provided for this podcast. You can follow him on Instagram at gunbuns, that's G-U-N-B-U-N-S, as well as his website, gunnarolson.net. Check out some of the samples that he has recorded. They're amazing. He's an amazing percussionist. If you want to follow the show, we've got a Facebook group, Some of All Fears. Instagram, Twitter, you can find us at Some Fear Fans. If you have some feedback for the show, email me at somefearfans 
S-O-M-E-F-E-A-R-F-A-N-S at gmail.com. I'll be happy to, to take those into consideration. Also, if you'd like to be a guest, email me at somefearfans at gmail.com. We can try to iron out some details and get that settled in. You know, give us some feedback if on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave a review. It makes the show bigger, and it's not going anywhere. I'm going to record as many in- shows as I possibly can. If you want to follow me on social media, I am at Ryan Perio. It's R-Y-A-N-P-E-R-R-I-O on all social media platforms. You can follow me there. And you can check me out at ryanperio.com, my website. I'll try to list upcoming shows there as well. It's been kind of spotty because as soon as I set it up, that's when the pandemic happened. And everything's kind of just in a, in a holding pattern. Thanks again for listening to the Sum of All Fears podcast. Next week, we'll have another guest with another fear. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.